Alright guys, how to cry back again today. I hope you're all doing well and enjoying your day so far and after all the speculation the last few weeks or so as to why Optic Texas do not seem to like to scrim at certain teams in the game, seemingly the New York Subliners among them, Rambo's given an explanation as to why that exactly was the case and why the Subliners scrimming them will start to happen very soon once again indeed. Very much enjoy your thoughts in the comment section below, hit the like button if you enjoy, subscribe if you're new as always, I would greatly appreciate it, really upset the channel, thank you very much indeed for doing that one. First I just wanted to mention this from Donnie Temp because somehow he ended up streaming to 200 viewers. Well, you know, just not even being there. He was gone for some reason, didn't turn the PC off. But of course, Tim was kind of the first one to talk about this, really. This whole like, Optic scrimming situation. He mentioned a few weeks ago, we looked at that uh, Optic don't scrim Paris at all. Because, uh, I mean, at least in his opinion, they're effectively, well, Optic don't believe Paris are up to much, which I think is fair enough. So Optic just don't want to scrim them because, you know, winning is teaching, I suppose. Losing is learning, as in they want to scrim the better teams. But they seemingly don't want to scrim teams that are too good because apparently they don't really like to play FaZe either because they feel like FaZe are going to be kind of their key competitors at every single major. They feel like if they're going to win a major, they might have to beat a team like FaZe, as of course they did at Major 1, so therefore they don't want to give anything away in those scrims. So they kind of uh, prefer to scrim kind of middle of the pack teams. So we'll see that here in a second, why New York might not necessarily have fit into that category so far this season, or why some people are kind of confused, why maybe um, the Optic are underestimating New York to some degree. That certainly has been part of the speculation. Now, I wanted to mention this as well here from Damon Kamabalo, because there's been some talk about next season, what is going to happen with regard to the third game mode. Parasite talks about the fact that I like, control literally gifts teams free map wins sometimes, I think this might have been in one of the London series where they won the control or whatever against Toronto, I think, and um, in a little bit of a strange fashion, to be honest. And Parasite saying, look, it's such a bad swing mode, and Karma's like, look, it's just straight up not good. So maybe he liked it back in the Black Ops 4 days, but maybe in Cold War in this game, like a control hasn't quite been what it was back in the day. So I'm not sure what they're going to do really with Modern Warfare 2, because of course, Domination, like, let's not even talk about Domination, but that was the game mode that was played, Map 3 back in Modern Warfare, and, um, and maybe Capture the Flag, maybe Control makes a return, maybe another game mode, right? Who knows if they can do uplink properly? Probably that would be, um, be a phenomenal thing. A little bit difficult without the advanced movement, right? But I'm sure they're thinking about what third game it is going to be. Of course, Doug said Tomartin is competing at Toronto. This apparently is his new team. Kind of confusing to me because Ghosty, I thought Ghosty, this guy moved in with him. It was meant to be his teammates. But all of a sudden, he's not playing with Ghost anymore. So I don't know what's happening there that he's dropped his own teammate that's living in his house or whatever's happened. But, uh, you know, anyway, apparently this might be the team that's going to compete at Toronto. Like, of course, in the Challenger side. And a player he might be playing against at one point or another in that kind of Challenger's tournament bracket would potentially be Clayster. He's going with his team that won the most recent uh, kind of cup that went on this past weekend. thought this is kind of incredible, actually, the fact that a lot of these YouTube videos are kind of old school VODs and just getting taken down. I don't know, like, um, if, I don't know if anyone behind the scenes at Activision or MLG or whatever is actually keeping these because some of these videos just disappear from these old tournament moments and Clayster apparently has been basically downloading them onto a hard drive that's like two terabytes big from like um, basically all of his team's games throughout history because for some reason they just start disappearing off YouTube and Activision will like copy strike them or just take them down. I have no idea where they go or even why this needs to be the case right but you know it's kind of unfortunate but it's good that Clayster maybe others as well are kind of keeping tabs on some of these legendary moments because it's honestly tough to find some of them sometimes and they just disappear without a trace. Speaking of Clayster they thought this was kind of cool he spoke to Jake Lucky for the full score gaming kind of tour that he did and um, he basically was asked the classic question who are the top five Call of Duty players in the world the first thing he mentions is look it's the top four the Optic Dynasty plus himself whatever order you want to put it in Skump, Crim6, Karma, Clayster and Formal I suppose those are his top five in any order I think that's probably fair enough for now, especially given the longevity of those guys' careers. The only ones that can even be close, really, are the likes of Aches and maybe J Cap, who are kind of there and thereabouts. Both two times world champions, both kind of legendary careers. But honestly, Clayster's words at the end of this, I thought, were particularly interesting, where he effectively said, look, he reckons that, you know, Simp will eventually pass them. Like, he reckons in the next five years, the top five certainly will change, and he says that Simp will be the greatest Call of Duty player of all time by the time he is done. So, that's certainly high praise for Simp. Top five is the Optic Dynasty in me. So, it's Krim, Karma, Scum, Formal, me. However you organize those five, that's up to you. Those are almost indisputable. Those are the top five Call of Duty players of all time. If you look at the whole body of work, you have to have us as top five. But I think as years go by, and like if I stop playing or if Krim or Scum, Formal and Karma already stop playing, and Simp keeps doing it and Abizi keeps doing it, they'll pass us eventually. I mean, they have to. Do you think it's any time in the next five years that that top five changes? Yes. I think Simp will be the greatest Call of Duty player of all time by the time he's done. But admittedly, this year he hasn't had the best time so far. But I mean, look, based on the last couple of years, the way Simp has played it, you know, he's going to get back to the top. He's going to win more events eventually. Whether it will be on the same phase at team that they currently have is another question mark, right? I think they'd be kind of stupid to break things up right now. But uh, look, if they don't win for the rest of this season, if they start off next season badly, there's some people who have said, look, maybe FaZe will decide to blow it up one time or another. But the thing is, if you do blow it up, where even is the upgrade? Which is like, 
I think one of the big questions there. So of course, like, there's 12 teams going to Major 3, only one of these teams will walk away with the title, and the Subliners, as we looked at earlier today, they need a good run here, right? They're only on 70 points, they're 30 points behind safety for World Championship qualification, and of course, there's not even safety, right? Because you could easily fall out of it as the rest of the season progresses. So they need a massive weekend. They play Seattle round one, they need to start putting points on the board, they pretty much every single series they play, they need to win. Their series against Optic was actually massive for them getting that victory on the board. But after, of course, that series went through, lots of people were saying, okay, wow, hang on a second, this is rather interesting, that Optic lost this series and Kismet had to say it on the flank after the fact that actually Optic don't like to play the subliners at all. So this is the bracket as it currently sits. Optic, if they beat the Mutineers and if subliners beat the Surges, they're probably just slight favourites to do, but it's kind of tough to say. That series is like so 50-50 in my opinion. But there's a reasonable chance that it's Optic versus New York again in a rematch in round two. We saw, of course, when they played in the qualifiers, Shotzi had an uncharacteristically bad series. Maybe he was just saving up his powers for the next day where he absolutely dominated, but it's possible we get a rematch right here. And it seems like Optic so far this season haven't really scrimmed the subliners at all. I don't know who their like regular scrim partners are. There was even talk earlier they don't really like to scrim Ultra too much. Pretty sure they don't scrim FaZe, they don't scrim Paris. They scrim Thieves a fair bit, I think. Maybe the Minnesota Rocker. Maybe Seattle Surge. There's certainly some teams that have a kind of regular scrim partners they like to play against, and subliners seemingly haven't really been in that conversation right. Now, the discussion was from Parasite here that um, after they lost this series, and with the kind of context of Kismet, that for whatever reason, the Optic guys don't like to play the subliners, potentially because they don't think they're good enough, but um, that doesn't seem to be the case. We'll see that in a second, especially with the way subliners are playing at the moment and having won the Prime Classic. Parasite reckons they underestimated the subliners, but Rambo explained it was actually for a rather different reason. Um, Kiz, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, how did you feel after the Tuscan going into um, the Tuscan hardpoint? I mean, we just I, you know, how do you guys I match up? Uh, I mean, and, and the Tuscan hardpoint, we have yeah. no idea. We've we've scrimmed them maybe once. They like, they don't scrim us, so we had no idea really. What? Wait, how... wait, 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 hold on. You said Opti doesn't scrim you? No, we haven't scrimmed them. Yeah, like, I think uh, we, like, we, oh. we played them once after. Listen, um, what I tell y'all, what I tell you, there's some there's some mental going on. I'm telling you. I don't know. We you, played them after the prom once, heads. and then outside of that, I don't yeah, know. didn't we... Donnie say the same thing that Optic doesn't scrim them either? So Optic maybe just blacklisting some of the teams at the bottom of the league. I mean, I mean to maybe, be fair maybe. though, I, I mean I don't know how it works. So I don't choose. Uh, yeah, to scrim, I, I, I mean, the, yeah, I mean to be fair to Optic is like they want the best practice, and they're probably trying to scrim like the teams at the top. Go ahead and say this. I think. Um, I'll do, although I do think New York is a top four team right now and they are definitely capable of beating Optic. I think Optic has just been on a high and they've been uh, very, they probably were just overconfident. They probably, I mean, that's fair. I could be, I could be, you know, stealing away some shine from New York here. But I just think they weren't as prepared. I also hear that apparently Optic doesn't scrim New York. So they probably, you know, they're not familiar with them, like playing, especially with their new but roster. But that makes no sense. Do you sense. know why? Oh, no. You know I, I mean, I'm not making an excuse. I don't know. But right, apparently, they don't, like, don't scrim phase either, apparently. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe they just don't Why? want to teach them. But either no way, idea. listen, look, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is these guys were obviously um, underestimating these guys. They're probably not as prepared. Uh, why don't I scrim New York? We haven't, We again, I answered this yesterday. We didn't really scrim them for the most part this year because they kept going through roster changes and not that they're like settled in again. Like we'll definitely start scrimming again. There's nothing really to it. So Rambo says that, yes, Kismet might be right. That they've barely scrimmed each other so far this season. Right? They, of course, only played each other for the first time in this matchup just a few days ago. But um, basically, this is the kind of key reason for well, this situation right? and for not scrimming them was because all the roster changes they were making at the first part of the year. They didn't want to scrim a team that was constantly changing every day. Like, um, and of course, that makes sense from the optic side. But of course, recently, since the Prime Classic, they've been looking rather good. So I'm kind of surprised in a way that, um, you know, since the Pro-Am, when, of course, they won the entire thing, you would have thought that, uh, you know, optic might have scrimmed into subliners over the previous preceding few weeks going into Major 3 because then I thought, okay, this team's good again. Let's give them a go. Or they thought the other way around and it's kind of a phase situation where if they consider New York to be kind of a top three team up there with phase, they might not want to scrim them because they might not give any ideas away or anything kind of why they don't seem to scrim phase right now. So it's interesting one if you're optic, right? Like who you scrim, who you don't scrim. Like, um, you know, do you scrim the teams kind of in the middle of the pack or where exactly do you want to go with it? Because you want to make sure you're getting good practice and not blowing Paris Legion out every single scrim. But at the same time, you want to, you know, make sure you're not giving anything away to other teams that might be some of your key competitors but Rambo says yeah they'll start scrimming these guys again shortly if of course I guess they well they continue their current form I suppose now um, you know speaking of that actually I thought this is kind of incredible speaking of all seasonal team KDs that the Calm Sympathy puts together so this is KDs for the entire season Optic remarkably despite of course playing with a couple of different substitutes have a 1.09 KD this season Seattle have a 1.04 phase of 1.04 as well actually third is kind of incredible here so Seattle number two in terms of season KD and remarkably actually 
Like, I'm pretty sure Donny Temp with his, like, 1.13 or whatever he has is carrying Paris Legion so hard. But Los Angeles Thieves have the worst KD in the league. A 0.94 average. Like, New York Sutherland's a 0.96 now, but I'm sure that's improving pretty dramatically as of late because they started the season woefully. But again, Thieves have the worst KD in the league right now. That is quite something, a 0.94. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to lose every single event. But on average, they're getting bodied more than any other team on a regular basis. And this, I thought, actually, from the Thieves side was, I mean, equally incredible, but kind of the other way around, where this is at what the team's rate win rates are in hard points when they win at the first hard point. So if they get the majority of the time on the first hard point, do they win the map or do they lose the map? Now, generally, of course, this is going to be above 50%. We see from Moptic, for example, it's 78%, 18 in 5 in their hard points when that happens. Actually, it's Toronto Ultra with a negative record, kind of interesting, the only team to be negative when they get the majority of time on P1 on the first rotation. They only win 7 out of 10 of those games. But Thieves win 14 out of 15. That is honestly absurd. Like, whenever they win the majority of time on the first hard point, for some reason, that just gives them momentum to win the entire game. Phase of 21 in 4, actually, in similar situations. But it's not like Thieves' hard point record has actually been that good. So it seems like whenever they lose the first rotation or the first hard point of the first rotation, they just get bodied for the rest of the game or whatever the case might be. So I thought that was actually kind of incredible. That you just have to keep your eyes on right when they play this upcoming weekend. Like if Thieves win at the majority of the time, if they get 30 seconds to 20 seconds of the other team on the first on the first hard point, then um, they're almost certainly going to win that map, it seems. And just to finish out the video here with, of course, well, the semi-finals time here on the greatest map bracket of all time, the two best competitive cods now face off. So it's officially Black Ops 2 versus Black Ops 3, Raid versus Fringe, Standoff versus Stronghold. And I mean, yeah, it's going to be a no-brainer who's going to win this at the end of the day. We could have seen it coming, right? But, um, you know, still kind of incredible that it ends up like this. I was kind of wondering if another map could have make it all the way through, but I thought it was pretty much inevitable that we would get Treyarch, you know, Treyarch Supremacy getting all the way to the final day. But yeah, here we go. These are the two kind of matchups that are going off right now. Standoff versus Stronghold. I voted Stronghold, even though I do actually think Standoff is the better map. But I voted Stronghold anyway, just to give it some more votes because it was a quality map and it's still getting bodied by Standoff right now. And then I also voted Fringe against Raid, even though, you know, I would also think that Raid is better. But I, again, I wanted to kind of make this a little bit closer, but still, it's not even close right now. So yeah, Raid and Standoff, they're both demolishing the Black Ops 3 maps. And uh, yeah, I reckon you guys can probably guess who's going to be the breaking point greatest map bracket champion but very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comment section below hope you guys enjoyed the video if you did enjoy it hit the like button tell us youtube gods this is a good video i'd just like you to see it as well and upgrade the competitive quality community thank you as always take care of yourselves and i'll see you next time